Welcome everyone. It's great to see you all virtually. I'm Ali Spain. I'm the executive director of the Microsoft Alumni Network. And as most of you know, the network is all about keeping alumni connected to all the things they loved about working at Microsoft, especially the people, uh, people who you worked with and who you worked for at the company. And that's why we're really thrilled tonight that Robbie Bach, is joining us tonight. Robbie spent 22 years at Microsoft in various business roles, including that of the chief Xbox officer. And since leaving the company, Robbie's been a very busy guy. And I actually think his post Microsoft life is actually more interesting and busier than his Microsoft career, potentially. But he's involved in a number of civic issues. He serves on nonprofit and for profit boards. He's a regular keynoter and lecturer. And he even owns a co co owns a um, gluten free pasta company. And if that's not enough, he's also found time and energy to become an author. Robbie has written two books, Xbox Revisited, which you may have read and recently out um, just before the holidays. Um, and the reason why we're here tonight is his first fiction novel, The Wil Wilkes, Wilkes Insurrection. And so tonight, Robbie's going to join us and share some of his insights um, about writing a techno thriller. He's going to share a bit of from the book, which is, will be really cool. I always love to hear authors talking, um, speaking from their book. And then Becky Monk, our editorial director here at the network, she's got some questions that she's going to ask Robbie. Um, and he might, she might even be able to pull out some reminiscing from his old Microsoft days as well. But we also want you to be able to ask questions as well. So in your um, at the top of your screen, you'll see two little bubbles with a little question mark. That's the Q&A window. So please make sure you put your questions for Robbie into that window and we'll triage those and make sure Robbie has time at the later in the program to um, to answer those. So really, without further ado, let's jump right into the book. I'd like to welcome Robbie Bach. Thanks, Ali. Thank you for uh, having me on and uh, thanks to everybody for joining. It is so much fun to be back connected with Microsoft people. I, I obviously still have some friends at the company um, and I have a lot of friends who are uh, in the alumni group for sure. Um, Ali mentioned our gluten-free pasta company, Manini's. I co-own that with Pete Higgins, who some of you may remember. Um, Brad and Judy Chase were just down here visiting. So Microsoft is family, and it is exciting uh, to be here with all of you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, I get to hold up my little book here, The Wilkes Insurrection, and just give you some background on the book. Uh, talk a little bit about the creative process. I'll, I'll read a, a selection from the book and then we'll we'll head into Q&A. So uh, you know, the Wilkes Insurrection is a book that has, a, you know, I broadly would describe it as a techno thriller. Um, there's a reasonable amount of technology in it, a bit of the dark web in it, uh, some political intrigue, and it's very contemporary. It is about the here and now. It takes place in 2019, 2020, and a little bit into 2021. So it's very much about what's going on in our country and the challenges we face here. And the basic premise of the book is that there is a, a pair of, of uh, anarchists who are trying to bring down the country and a collection of, of characters rise up to try, try to stop them. Um, when I got started with this book, just to talk a little bit about the creative process, when I got started with this book, you kind of have to go back to Xbox Revisited, which is the first book I wrote. You know, that was a nonfiction strategy book, and it was about the strategy process we used, which I now call the 3P framework, to help fix the Xbox business in the in the golden early days of 2002, 2003. And, you know, I found writing really pleasurable. I enjoyed writing. And then I started thinking when that book was done and I published it and I went through the marketing process and selling it. And I started thinking about writing a second book. And I said, I, I, you know, as much as I love writing nonfiction, I really want to try something more challenging. And I, I went back to my Xbox days of watching all that creative work that went into creating a great video game. And I challenged myself to say, could I do that in written form? I can't do it in video games. I'm a horrible video game player. Anybody in the Xbox team will tell you, don't let Robbie near a controller because he's not very good. But I'm a good writer. And uh, so I challenged myself to be creative in a writing context. And from that came the Wilkes Insurrection. And, and the book started really with character sketches. I wrote over 100 pages, just about four or five characters. 
where they were at a certain point in time, what they were doing in their life, a little bit of their background, and just trying to set the context for who they were. And from those character sketches um, came to me a plot. And from that plot came villains. And the way those characters interacted with those villains and how that evolved. And pretty soon I was writing a techno thriller. And I had to do tons of research. There's hundreds of people I could thank in this process um, because people were very generous uh, with their time. Uh, my, my lead character, as you'll see in a moment, is, is a woman. She's a uh, woman of color. She's in the military. Uh, I am not a woman. I am not of color and I'm not in the military. So you can imagine the, the process of putting myself in, in place to be able to, to write about that. It's super challenging, but super interesting. Um, and, and, and I hope you'll enjoy that, that writing. Uh, I'm not a technologist, so getting the technology right was challenging. Um, There's just a lot of research that had to be done. I pulled that research together, built it into the plot, and uh, then did a, did a bunch of editing, and this fall the book, the book came out. Um, the other thing I will say from a creative perspective, um, there's a lot of AR, VR references in the book. I did a lot of research on the AR, VR marketplace. Um, so those of you who know a HoloLens um, uh, obviously will will recognize some AR VR technology. There's also a lot of music involved in the book. Uh, I use music quotes to inspire different parts of the book. And in fact, if you go to wilksinsurrection.com, the website for the book, there are playlists for each of the main characters and a playlist for the book because I listened to thousands of hours of music uh, while I was writing the book. So um, I thought I would share with you just a couple of review quotes and then I'll share with you um, something from, uh, from the book. Uh, this first quote is from Men Reading Books um, and it says the following quote, the story of, uh, of Major Tamika Smith's progress in the political world and the one of a terrorist are tightly woven together. Author Bach added compelling characters to fill out this story. The Wilkes Insurrection is without question the best thriller I've read this year. I give it my highest recommendation. Uh, and the second quote I just thought I'd share is from the essay examiner, and it says the following. Some of the best political thrillers take place in our current turbulence environment, and the Wilkes insurrection is no exception. Set from 2019 to the end of the past presidential election, it contains the perfect mix of villains and heroes, and even anti-heroes. Right from the first page, the action comes at the reader full-blown and does not let go. The action is fast paced, the language is easy to understand, and being mostly dialogue driven, the story flows effortlessly from page to page. Recommended for readers who enjoy the best of Brad Thor, David Baldocki, and Robert Ludlum. Hopefully this will turn into a series so readers can read more about Major Tamika Smith's heartbreaking yet heroic story. So that gives you a little bit of background, tells you a little bit about what people have been saying about the book. Um, uh, and so I thought maybe what I'd do is read I'm going to read from something early in the book so I don't give away the plot. Uh, this is from chapter three, which is when we first meet uh, Major Tamika Smith. And uh, uh, let me just read from that and then we'll we'll jump right from there to uh, Q&A and let you guys uh, drive the rest of the conversation. Chapter three, the crash. The call came at 1947. What the hell are you waiting for? Major Tamika Smith yelled into the phone. Hit the damn alarm and scramble the team. She slammed down the receiver without waiting for an answer. As a reservist, Tamika was scheduled to report to Offutt Air Force Base one week in a month for training. At least that was the theory. With all branches of the mil military still heavily engaged in the Middle East, she was the acting combat search and rescue leader, or CSAR in Air Force speak, responsible for all emergency operations at the base. Practically speaking, she was stuck at Offutt. Her law career and job as a Senate staffer in Washington, D.C., on hold for the foreseeable future. Once in the Air Force, always in the Air Force. Thankfully, her quarters were just two quads across from the CSAR facilities, directly past the flight line. The sprint to the hangar would have done her Air Force Academy track and field coach proud. Tamika arrived to see crews putting on boots and donning fire gear. She almost knocked down a captain coming around a corner. What's going on, Major? He began a rapid fire set of questions. Who hit the alarm? Should I call the commander? How can I help? Tamika recognized him as the base commander's senior aide, a tall, thin drink of water from Louisiana. Slow down, Washington. Let me get on the mic and we'll go from there. Breathe, Tamika. 
She grabbed the handheld mic attached to the wall by an accordion cable. Attention all crews. And then, hey, shut the hell up. Quiet, finally. Now, more calmly, she began. Listen carefully. She tried to balance her sense of urgency with the need for people to take a deep breath and focus. We've got an inbound civilian 757 with 213 souls on board, 200 passengers and 13 crew. They blew a door at 34,000 feet and have lost significant hydraulic control. They're trying to dump fuel, but we should assume that fire and smoke are in our future. They'll be coming from the northwest on runway 12. Tough to guess about touchdown, but the pilot will make sure he gets over the airfield. So let's set up on ramp B, five minutes out. Obviously, this is not a drill. Air traffic control could have diverted the plane to Omaha or Lincoln, but off it had some decided advantages. In particular, its remote location reduced the likelihood of casualties on the ground. Her instructions would put the bulk of her team partway down off its main runway. Given the likelihood of fire, getting stationed close to the scene would buy them critical seconds to douse any flames and pull out survivors. But too far down the runway might make them roadkill in the wreckage. Washington, you need to call Commander Jessup, but he's not going to be much help here until the press arrives. At that point, his unique pain and he has skills might be useful. If you really want to help, you can pair up with me. The look on the young captain's face had equal elements of excitement and terror kind of like a teenage boy about to get to second base with his girlfriend for the first time. To his credit, he didn't hesitate. Major, I've done some training, but you'll have to tell me what I need to do. Yelling above the sound of vehicles revving up, she kept her instructions short and to the point. Grab some gear, Captain, and follow me. Keys are in the truck. They jumped into a vehicle and raced out onto the field with Tamika directing him down the ramp toward the middle of the runway. Putting on her equipment, she realized she'd better prepare him for what was coming. Look, if this plane comes down hard, there'll be shit everywhere. Plane parts, luggage, smoke, and probably body parts. That did not improve the look on Washington's face. Just stay focused on our task and you'll be fine. Part of the team will jump on any fires, but our assignment is getting people out and away to safety. As the plane goes past us, we're gonna go like a bat out of hell after it on the runway. Get as close to the fuselage as you can, then stay with me. I've done this too many times before. Once in position, Tamika looked down the runway, mentally tracing a line out toward the horizon. Dusk was, dusk was settling across the prairie sky in hues of blue, red, and purple. Through the haze, she spotted the 757 with its wing and belly lights blazing. This was clearly not your typical approach. It looked like a boat bobbing across a rough ocean. First up, then down, now left, followed by steep right. Rev it up, Captain. It looks like he'll be lucky to get it down somewhere on the field. On the radio. Listen up. Stay narrow for now. I don't think they have much lateral control, and I don't want any of us to get hit. Once he goes by, we can spread out based on how lucky he gets. Let's make this count. The growl of the truck engines filled her ears. In that instant, memories of enemy attacks crashed in. The smell of smoke, the feel of heat, and the cacophony of sounds associated with battle. Tamika's ears rang with the crackle of a radio, the screams of wounded, and the continuing jackhammer sounds of machine gun fire. Staring straight ahead, Tamika fought to stay in control, to push back the unwelcome memories that sometimes closed in around her. Major, Major Smith? I'm here, Captain. Adrenaline brought her back to the moment. Just drive the damn truck when the plane goes by. With binoculars, Tamika could see the gaping hole on the right side of the fuselage as the plane shimmied back and forth across the approach vector. It crossed the outer boundary of the field, looming large as it sailed by. Go, 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 she screamed as the cavalcade of fire and rescue vehicles took off down the runway. At the last moment before touchdown, the plane lurched down on its left side. It bounced once and then broke apart. The midsection flipped over and slid across the end of the runway. Both wings split off, followed by a fireball. Sounds of destruction boomed across the field. The initial strike had split the nose away from the main body of the plane. What looked like the first six or seven rows of the passenger compartment, along with the cockpit, slid all the way past the end of the runway, but looked upright and relatively intact. The main cabin, on the other hand, was in shambles. It went off to the right side of the runway, settling upside down, facing backward. 
Smoke poured from ga gaps in the shell. The last 10 rows of the plane had separated hard at landing and somersaulted into a ditch on the left side of the runway, surrounded by crushed debris from the tail. Let's get some foam on the main cabin to the right, Tamika yelled into her radio. Crews one, two, and three converge on the midsection of the fuselage. Four, you have the nose. Five, you're on the tail section. Let's move. She slammed down the radio and yelled at Washington. Put us right next to that big hole in the front of the cabin. You're gonna want it, well, you're gonna want your oxygen mask on. They screamed down the last stretch of one way, then veered off into the sloped grass approach, approaching what was left of Flight 209. As they swung around to the side of the plane, Tamika jumped out of the truck before it had rolled to a stop. She ran up to the opening with her heart pounding. She took a deep breath, then leapt into the fire. In that instant, she knew it would be for the last time. And that ends chapter three. So um, what I think we probably would, should do now is uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, our moderators and have them ask me some questions, some that they have, and hopefully some that you have. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the book and uh, see where that takes us. And then uh, we'll wrap up as, as the questions diminish and the time ends. Let's go from there. Sounds great. Well, that was fantastic. And everybody, that was just chapter three. So remember that it gets wild and wilder and crazier as it goes along. Um, I just loved um, all the plot twists um, and how you sort of started bouncing us around the US. I love that there's a female protagonist um, and that we even get to see a little bit of the dark side of technology. You mm. really keep everybody on the edge of their seats, Robbie. I, I love that. Um, so my first question really goes to the lead time for this book, because we know it takes a long time to research and write and publish a book. But so much has happened in the last, you know, year. <laughs> and it's sort of interwoven into the book. So can you talk a little bit more about your timing? Um, how much of this was written pre-January of last year? <laughs> right. You know, it's, it, I will tell you, it's a little surreal for me. I wrote the bulk of the book. In fact, I wrote more than the bulk of the book. The first version of this book was 175,000 words, which in, in Microsoft Word is 550 pages. Um, and the current version of the book is 107,000. So it's gone on a diet since I originally wrote it. But I wrote most of that in 2016, 2017, and a little bit into 2018. So you can imagine my surprise when things I thought of at the time were a little bit far out and unexpected started actually happening. And it's a bit um, strange. And with the exception of the pandemic, which I did add quite late in the book because I didn't think the book felt real without the pandemic. And by the way, the pandemic supported the thesis of my, of my villains. So it was actually fit right into the story. But with the ex exception of the pandemic, I didn't have to add things. Um, the things I wrote early on, uh, including, you know, right up to uh, some things that happened at the end of the story, um, we're all written from my imagination and, and, you know, life starts to imitate art, I suppose. Okay, so when you came up with the title, insurrection wasn't really a word that was just bandied about at the dinner right. table or over cocktails. Right. Now, was there a conversation after January of 2021 that uh, between you and your publishers about what the name of the book was going to be? Yeah. Yes, so um, initially the book, well, the very first title of the book, honestly, was America the Beautiful with a question mark, um, which I found very artful and nobody else found very interesting. And then through most of the writing, the title of the book was The Lincoln Coalition. And as you read the book, you'll understand why it was called The Lincoln Coalition. But of course, that got messy because the, the Lincoln Project uh, interceded, went public with their name, and the Lincoln Coalition and the Lincoln Project don't have very much in common. And so I couldn't, I couldn't use that title. And so when we, when we got to uh, 2021 and we got ready to publish the book, we had to literally come up with a new title. 
Um, and uh, Wilkes is the name of the villain. And insurrection at that point was a word that absolutely made sense and, and, and fit the story perfectly. And I, I can't tell you if I would have come up with that word without an actual insurrection having happened, but um, uh, it certainly fit at that point and, and was timely. Fantastic. I, I just, I, I had just been wondering since you told me what the name of it was, I just was so curious about that. So um, I'd love to talk a little bit about your, your creative process. Um, one of our uh, questions that came in also wants to know that. So where do you get your ideas? How do you get your juices flowing? So I'd say there's um, sort of three things that get my juices flowing. Um, one is music, which I know this may sound counterintuitive, but I listen to a lot of music. Um, I, I, some of you won't, you, most of you won't know this, but I was on the board of Sonos for, for 10 years from 2010 to 2020. So I have quite the music gear set up in my, in my office. Um, and so music to me inspires me and, and themes that I see in music come out in the book. Um, the second thing I use to inspire me is I go on long dog walks, which again may sound counterintuitive. Uh, my poor dog Roscoe has been on, you know, sort of a four mile a day regimen throughout this whole process. And those walks are sort of meditative for me. They enable me to sort of get away and, you know, and per, you know, especially when I was doing the final editing during COVID, you know, there was nobody in the neighborhood. And so uh, uh, the mean streets of Medina were actually really, uh, really quiet. And it was just a way to sort of be thoughtful about it. Um, and then the third thing, which I, I suppose is embarrassing, is I come up with a lot of plot ideas in the shower and I have to, you know, run out and try to figure out how to write them down before I forget them. Creativity to me um, comes from all angles. And I think if you talk to people, like if I talk to the creative teams in the Xbox group or in the Microsoft gaming group, um, I bet you could ask, you know, 20 studios and they'd all say they have a different creative process if they have a process at all. And they'd all say the creativity comes from all different angles. And the hard part is just recognizing it for what it is. Um, and so, you know, uh, as an example, there's a character in the book, Bryce Roscovich, who at the beginning of the story was... Uh, a plot thought and a background note to some of my other characters. And there was a point at which I said, oh my gosh, there's an awesome role for Bryce in this book. And now he's one of the top uh, four or five characters in the story. And I can't tell you where that came from. And it was on a dog walk. I went back and started writing notes and started writing chapters that day. Uh, it's just kind of kind of how it works. Um, and, uh, you know, I wish there was some magic fairy dust, but I don't think there is. <laughs> Well, I think everyone has um, everyone has their own process. Uh, mm. I do I do find it interesting that you started with characters. Characters really drive every story, um, and so I'm I I want to dig a little bit deeper there because um, I think every other fiction author out there, and you did too, right? Says. What's the legal language for it? Any similarities to actual people is purely coincidental, right? right. But how did you <laughs> think about your character development and really get into their heads? I know, I know, you talked about music, um, but some of these folks are nothing like you. I mean, you're a white dude, <laughs> <laughs> from yeah, and uh, you you weren't in the military. Right. Uh, you you have a business background and you know you've already said you're not super techie so the wilk center insurrection deals with many many different cultural undercurrents right um how did you address some of that um and i know you've called them kind of your blind spots so how did you address that and really get it right you know, it's a really important question because people get asked all the time about, you know, you know, how could you write from that person's point of view when you're not that person? And, you know, in, in my own case, the good news is, and people who read the story will, will recognize this as they go along, I write from a lot of people's point of view. So this person, each chapter is written from one of the characters' point of view, but it changes chapter by chapter. So while a meaningful percentage of the book is written from Tamika Smith's point of view, 
I write from a bunch of other characters' points of view as well. And so it's not like I'm trying to, to claim expertise over any one thing. I'm just trying to tell the story from different angles and trying to put my head in those people's people's places. And in each of the in each of the characters that I, I consider main characters, people whose point of view I take, I've tried to draw from my experience, draw from the times when I've had meaningful conversations with people draw from the time, in some cases where I've done research, I, in the military, I did a ton of research, um, and, and, and try to um, put myself as ably as I can in, in their shoes. Um, the other thing I did was I had tons of people read the book and read drafts of the book. Some people, unfortunately, had to read 175,000 words and 550 pages. Others got the, the discount version and only had to read you know, 350 pages. But I had a lot of people read the book, men, women, black, white, um, lots of different uh, religions because there's uh, an Islamic element in this book that comes through and, and, and you, you know, you have to write about that and deal with that appropriately. And so there's, there's lots of different angles. And I got some amazing feedback from people, They're incredibly generous with their thoughts and ideas. You know, there's Arabic language in the book, so I tried to get the Arabic language right. Um, those of you who are munitions experts, yes, I've now discovered that the Glock doesn't have a manual safety. I apologize for that error in the book. I've had two or three people point that out to me. Um, but I've tried to get all of those things, all of those things right. Um, in the end of the day, the thing that's most, um, I suppose, gratifying for me is that most of the people who read the book, uh, in particular women who read the book, think I write from a woman's perspective better than I do from a man's perspective. And in, on reflection, I think that's largely because I had to work harder uh, for the writing. It's almost too easy to write from a man's perspective because I, I share that point of view. And so it didn't, didn't come across as creative as um, um, as thought provoking. And, you know, writing from a woman's point of view, obviously, is super difficult for me. But and all of the, those of you who are women reading or watching, you can read and send me email and correct me or, 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 or beg to differ. But people find that the writing from Tamika's perspective is some of the most powerful writing in the story. And, you know, Tamika goes through a lot, as you'll see in the book. Uh, writing all of that was difficult, some of it uh, painful. Um, and yet, um, you know, again, I think some of that writing's uh, the best. So uh, that's a long rambling answer. There's no one unique answer other than uh, dig in. And and you you really did because you you talked to so many people and you you've got so much feedback and we're able to incorporate that and, and make it make it a great a great book. Um, we were talking you know a little bit about music. Uh, we've had a couple of folks who want to know more about creating the playlists for your um, <laughs> for your characters and right. why you did that. Well, it's a, it's a great question. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the initial um, inspiration for it, and then I'll tell you what that turned out to be. The initial inspiration is I had this vision that um, entertainment genres are coming together, right? The, the line between a video game and a movie is pretty, pretty narrow these days, right? And the line between, you know, TV and movies, yeah, super narrow these days. And, you know, the line between music and video games, you know, I go back all the way to the original Halo. What was the thing everybody recognizes? Well, it's the theme music um, and Master Chief, of course. But so to me, I wanted to write a book that actually had a soundtrack in it. And I literally wanted there to be a soundtrack that would play as you were reading. Well, A, on a 350-page book, that's going to be a really long soundtrack. And, and B, the, the technical practicalities of it weren't there. So as I was writing the book, I said, okay, I can't do that, but I'm gonna pick um, lyrics to start each part of the book. The book has five parts. And each part of the book starts with a lyric that hopefully hints at a little bit of what's to come. Not from a plot perspective, but just sort of the sensibility for what you're going to experience. And I cover a lot of different genres of music. Um, you know, you got everything from Amy Grant to the Eagles to, you know, a, a few other, Gym Class Heroes is in there. So it, there's a, there's mostly pop focus, but a lot of different um, uh, genres and, and styles of music, but the lyrics are meaningful. And then when I got done with the book, I said, okay, 
each of my characters needs a theme song. So the first song in their playlist is their theme song. Um, those theme songs automatically go into the Wilkes Insurrection soundtrack. And then for each of the characters, I tried to tell their personal story through the selections of songs. And some of those were easy. You know, the Tamika Smith playlist could have been a little longer. Um, the Bryce Roscovich playlist could have been longer. Um, but like the Ford Wilkes playlist, you know, writing a playlist for a villain was hard. Um, but, you know, you, you go through and you do some exploration to do it. I found some music I'd never heard before and it was cool and it fit. So then you consolidate that and, uh, you know, doing playlists on Spotify is super easy. And, you know, the good news is for the lyrics that are in the book, I actually had to license the rights to the lyrics. That was not the most straightforward process. But for the playlist, they're just playlists on Spotify. So there's no licensing involved. And, you know, if over time I want to think hmm, that song didn't quite fit, I just changed the playlist. It's uh, it's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I listen to those playlists and, you know, they're meaningful for me. Well, everybody can find the playlists um, right. on your website. Yep. Uh, and I, I had to chuckle because, you know, your heroine, her theme song is a Christine Aguilera song. Yep. And your villain um, has, and I did laugh. It was it was great. John Mellencamp. Yeah. The Authority song. <laughs> Listen, the truth is, the truth is, I listen to a lot of John Mellencamp. I have his double. This is going to date me. I have his double LP greatest hits album, and um, I listen to that album all the time. I think it's amazing, wonderful music. But the Authority song absolutely fits Ford Wilkes. Um, and, uh, the Christine Aguilera song fits, fits Tamika Smith. And, you know, there's, um, you know, the theme song from Top Gun fits, uh, my, my Colonel Jerry Jessup character really well. So there's just music. Some of it's obvious pop stuff, but some of it's a little bit more obscure. There's a little three dog night makes a brief appearance in the, the Tamika Smith, uh, playlist, which is, it's kind of fun. Um, there's, there's a little bit of rapping in, in, in a couple of the playlists. So, you know, you just try to cover the, the waterfront, not because that was the goal, but because that's where creativity takes you. And the music and the, the music and the book inspired me going back and forth. Absolutely. We've got quite a few questions coming in now. Great. Um, so I'd love to hit on some of these. Um, let's see, I'm going to save that one for later. Um, so, okay, so um, when, okay, when did you know what the ending would be and <laughs> did it change as your writing progressed? Um, that's a good question. That's a really great question. Um, I, when I started the book, I had written you know, probably 150 pages before I had a clear plot in mind. Um, I then went back and did two things at that point. I went back and wrote a prologue, which is a scene from the book that takes place very close to the end. And I wrote that prologue without knowing how the story was going to get there. And so there's no outline that said, oh, this is how we get to that prologue. The prologue takes place in like chapter 50. And, but I wrote it at the beginning of the book and I wrote it from the villain's perspective. And so it's the first first thing in the book. So you'll read it, and it's the villain, um, and he's talking about a scene, and then later in chapter fifty in the book, I write the same scene from the FBI's perspective, and you know the scene is the same, but obviously the writing is completely different. So to that extent, I was about one hundred and fifty pages in when I wrote that part of it. Um, quickly thereafter, I knew there was going to be a uh, a scene, uh, in fact, more than one that takes place in Washington, D.C. Um, and I wanted the book to, as you'll understand, return to D.C. and end there. And I, that was that that I knew pretty early. I didn't write the scene explicitly until the very end. And in fact, I rewrote it several times, but I knew it was going to happen there relatively early. But in between, like there's a scene that takes place in Seattle that didn't get written until 2019. Um, so there were things that got added um, after the fact um, uh, because they fit into the story better. Got it. Great. Well, um, so I know one of the things um, we've talked about before um, is how much your network 
um, has helped helped you um, with especially the technology part of the book. Oh yeah. So I know that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that sort of the outreach to your your alumni network? Yeah, I, there's there's so many people who are alums who helped with this book. Uh, Kim Brown Seeley, who worked all the way back on Mungo Park, for those of you who go back that far, was the first person to read um, what was then called America the Beautiful. Uh, she is an author of her own. She's written a, a great book um, and she's written tons of, of travel articles. She's a wonderful writer. Um, uh, Justina Chen, who has written seven or eight books, uh, mostly teen uh, uh, women's books, but um, she's been, she and I've worked together twice. She was my speechwriter during my last two years at Microsoft. She gave me incredible feedback. Uh, Greg Shaw, who worked at Microsoft for a period of time, um, gave me some great referrals. Um, Ed Freeze, um, who many of you may know from Excel days um, or from the, the gaming days, um, Ed is still heavily involved in the gaming community and uh, in fact now uh, runs a venture capital firm in the gaming community. Ed introduced me to every AR VR startup in Seattle. And I think I did, I don't know, 11 or 12 hour to two hour interviews with all of them. I think I cursed them because I think 10 of them went bankrupt. Um, but I gathered a ton of information from them on the AR VR landscape and you know in the irony of all ironies i'm now on the magic leap board of directors which is an ar company so you you sort of these things all come full circle so there were a number of people um at microsoft who who gave me you know really good advice i'm, I'm leaving off you know 20 or 30 of them right and so there's, ton, there's tons of people brad there's a, a a trailer uh a video trailer on the website for the book you should definitely check that out and you'll recognize uh, Brad Chase and Judy Chase. They helped me do the voiceover for that. Um, so there's, uh, I, I could go on and on, but the alumni network was really powerful in helping uh, bring this book alive. Cool. Uh, well, you mentioned Ed. So I want to kind of detour a little bit from this and, <laughs> uh, and just ask a quick Microsoft question. Sure. Um, I don't think our audience uh, is going to, uh, object to that at all. Uh, so in case the audience didn't know, n November marked the 20 year, uh, 20 years since the launch of of Xbox. And um, you and Ed were both pretty, uh, pretty busy surrounding the anniversary. You were in a documentary that Microsoft produced and the Xbox pioneers. Uh, production that we partnered with right. um, and people can watch that on the YouTube channel if they haven't yet and I think Ali's going to put that uh, in oh there you go Ali's got it in the chat for you um, so if you you know were to hop in the Wayback Machine um, mm. and think about what struck you the most in the time since you know, you guys launched Xbox to now. What, what do you, what do you think about um, the most? Well, uh, look. First of all, to, if any of the folks from that original team, um, I guess we're supposed to be called OGs now. I didn't even understand what that stood for 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 a while. But uh, in any event, I think it stands for old geezers in my case. But if any of you from the original team are on uh, on the call, uh, thank you and congratulations. It's an honor to work with you. And 20 years is an amazing achievement. So I I say that with with great respect. Um, the thing I reflect on the most is how much the gaming space has changed. Um, you know, when we started, you know, there was some PC gaming, some console gaming. The two things didn't have anything in common, really. Um, in fact, one of the challenges of starting Xbox is people felt like we were deserting the PC uh, games marketplace. And in some ways, that, that criticism was fair. And now I look at what's going on in the gaming space, and it's all, it's all just this giant form of entertainment. There's mobile gaming, there's, you know, PC gaming, there's AR VR gaming, there's console gaming, there's PCs playing against consoles, there's games that have a, a mobile component and a, and, a, and a full screen component. You know, Microsoft is spending, you know, $65 billion on content. I mean, it's crazy. And, and the people who are playing are, has changed. When, when, when we were doing the original Xbox, 
let's just be honest, most of the people were guys. Now everybody's a gamer. Um, and I think that's powerful. Um, the last thing I'll say that has changed, um, and I say this with great respect, is the leadership of Xbox um, a better represents the world and better represents the gaming community from a, a whole host of demographic and, and psychographic perspectives, and also is uh, way better at creating a culture that that um, really pushes a, the broad range of creativity. I just think Phil and his team have done um, remarkable work. I am so impressed. Um, I'm envious. Um, you know, in some ways, our work was trying to birth something, and the culture was kind of crazy, and it was hard to get our hands right, hands wrapped around it. And we kind of got it going in the right direction during the, the last five years or so of my time there. But the team has just taken it to another level, and um, you know, I'm 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 pretty awed by what they've done. And I, I think other people at Microsoft and alumni should be really excited to see what Microsoft's doing in that space. Terrific. One of the uh, one of the questions is, um, are there any Microsoft stories that may have made it into the book that you can share? Um, let's see. Microsoft stories that made it into the book. I so there's a scene in the book which isn't literally from Microsoft, but is inspired by in some ways by a meeting we had in the early days of Xbox. Without spoiling the scene, there's a boardroom scene in the book. Um, that has nothing to do with uh, Microsoft and has nothing to do with, with gaming or anything else. But in some ways, I think that's, that scene was inspired by the Valentine's Day Massacre meeting we had um, in Xbox, uh, which was, uh, if, you, if, you watch, if you watch any of the Pioneers event or you watch the, the documentary, you'll learn everything about the Valentine's Day Massacre event. If you read my book, you'll learn about it. Um, it was an epic meeting uh, with a with Bill Gates and, and Steve Ballmer. A lot of yelling, a lot of old school Microsoft table pounding, um, uh, some bad vocabulary, um, with a great outcome. And you know, so in some ways, that that boardroom scene I think is inspired uh, a little bit by 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 that meeting. Um, and you know, and I think the other thing that comes out in in the story is just the the idea that technology is not good or bad. Technology just is technology. And it's people that are good or bad and how they use that. And I think Microsoft, um, you know, in some ways epitomizes that. Uh, the technology, Microsoft technology does get used for good and bad. I don't think the company's bad. I think the company's fabulous and great and it's done really amazing things and it contributes to the community and it's engaging. But the technology is this neutral force and our job is to drive the technology forward and try to teach and, and, and encourage people to be responsible with it. And that certainly comes across in the book. Yeah. So um, what was it like to create a villain? Mm. And did you have a real person in mind when you were writing the character? Um, creating, a, creating villains, because there's actually two of them, um, was perhaps the hardest character work I had to do. Um, you know, I have my strengths and my weaknesses, but I'm not an evil person. Um, and so drawing up the um, the personality traits and being able to write from an evil person's perspective um, is actually, I found quite challenging and difficult. And I, and I also had two villains who were working together and who I had to make sure were different. And that also was surprisingly difficult. So I had to have, I had to write, you know, twice the trouble of villains. And writing one was hard, writing two was really difficult. Um, one of which who is clearly an American and the other of whom is uh, an Arab. And so that's just like, whoa, whoa, kind of blows your mind uh, complicated, at least for me it was. So I think that was some of the some of the hardest writing I had to do. And it was one place where when I, I did have a professional editor read the book, um, that was the one character aspect that I got a lot of feedback on. And then I had to do some very difficult work kind of halfway through the process to fix what that editor saw and which I agreed with were legitimate flaws in the characterization of those people. Got it. Um, so what was it like um, to write a thriller? Did you, do when you, you were going through all the character plots uh, before you came up with the actual plot, were you thinking this is going to be a thriller? Or how did no, that work? No, did in you? fact I didn't. And, and it took me a little while to get there. 
Um, you know, when I when I set out to write this book, I said I want to do three things. I want to write a great story. I didn't say I want to write a great thriller. I said I want to write a great story. I want the story because because I think the story is what makes people read it. But maybe that's obvious. I want it to be well written. You know, I read a I read a lot of fiction today, which I, is interesting in particular in this genre. There's a lot of fiction that's interesting with great plots that's actually poorly written. And I didn't want to write one of those stories. So I wanted to write something that I could hold up and say, hey, this is actually well written. And then the third thing I set out to write was something that at the end people would say, wow, that was a great story. I love the characters. And hey, maybe I learned a little bit. And so figuring out how to fit all that together um, was complicated. And once I set in on the idea that it was a thriller, I actually had to do a lot of work to focus just on the thriller aspect. And that's how I cut 200 pages from the book. Because thrillers don't have a lot of backstory. Well, literally, there was a chapter in the book, one of my, the first editor who helped me with the book, looked at it and said, wow, that is beautifully written. Now write it in two sentences. Because you don't get a whole chapter to say all that. You get two sentences to say that. Because this is a thriller and it has to move. And so suddenly you have this demand for constantly keeping the plot advancing and everything you write has to advance the plot even though you're developing these characters and communicating background that was super challenging but really fun work um and you know so at that point once i got on the thriller train so to speak you sort of get the idea okay first sentence in every chapter has to grab people's attention last sentence of every chapter has to leave people hanging okay i got it uh, you know <laughs> short chapters all right so my chapters are all four or five pages long that actually was easier for me. I liked that. So, you, you know, you sort of get in that mode and then you drive from there. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, a couple of our people want to know, um, were you trying to appeal to women when you were writing? And could you also talk a little bit more about the woman in the military who influenced the story for you? Yeah, uh, it's, it's it'll both good questions. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, I wrote this book actually for young adults, and I wrote this book hoping that women would read a thriller. Um, the thriller genre is not dominated by women. It's more dominated by men. Women read more mysteries than men do. Men read more thrillers than women do. Um, and, and mysteries and thrillers are not the same. There's entire books that will tell you all the differences between thrillers and, and, and mysteries. And so I was hopeful that women would read this book because some of the subplots and some of the sub stories um, are there and need to be told um, and need to be heard. And, you know, I felt like in my professional career, uh, you know, I tried to support women in the best way I knew how. And I think I did an OK job of that. I think I could do a lot better now. And I think I would be a, a stronger leader on that front. And I think as an example, I think Phil has been exceptional on that on that front. And a number of the, of the people who I work with and mentor in nonprofits and for-profit organizations are women. And I enjoy that work the most because I think they have a different side of them. I know that's stereotyping, but I think it's there's there's an EQ IQ thing that goes on. And the women I work with have great EQ and I love to bring that out and I love to learn from it. And I think it's powerful. And so stereotypes are dangerous. And so I, I don't, don't take that the wrong way, but um, I, I find that's what my experience has been. And so writing about Major Tanika Smith to me was an opportunity to sort of draw that out and to bring out a person who could be truly heroic, but have incredible flaws and somebody who could uh, be really challenged and yet be a great leader and somebody who could be in a man's world and there's no bigger man's world than the military and be in a man's world and succeed. Yeah. And so, you know, that to me was uh, was challenging and fun and interesting. Now, I had um, a, a number of women help me with the story. I've already talked about Kim Brown Seeley and, and Justina Chen, who some of you may know as Tina. Some of you may even know her as Tina Headley. Um, there's, um, but they both gave me a lot of great feedback on... Uh, uh, on, on, on women and women in work and things they experience and those types of things. And then I had uh, two women in the military who I did not know um, who 
Uh, I actually met through a, a general who serves on a board I'm on. <laughs> so there's a general, uh, a retired general on the uh, in the Air Force on the Boys and Girls Club board. He referred me to two women, one of whom was a captain, another who was a lieutenant colonel. They both read the military sections of the book and gave me amazing feedback on Tamika, military life, et cetera. And then there's a, a third person, uh, John Davis, um, who did some, actually worked at Microsoft, I think, as a contractor for a while. He may have been a full-time employee for a while. JD and I were basketball buddies. He was a graduate of the Air Force Academy, and he gave me feedback on the Air Force sections as well. And so through the combination of all of that heavy lifting from other people, I was able to sort of craft what Tamika was. And the last part of that, I'll just point out, there's a, a, a woman in, in the Boys and Girls Club movement who's very senior in the organization who happens to be a black and who I asked her to read a completed version of the story. And I asked her to read it because I thought she'd have great ideas in the story, but I in particular asked her, to, and you have to do this as an author explicitly, read this as a black woman and tell me what you think. And her feedback was uh, really uh, clarifying for me. And I didn't even realize that this was uh, what had happened. But she said, you wrote a black woman um, who is heroic, but who is not this a uh, crazy hero person who's not real. And she said, that to me is a great achievement to write somebody who's very real, who has flaws, who um, isn't perfect, and who has to deal with her her weaknesses and, and figure it out, and yet is still a strong black woman. And that's a, you know, uh, that's one person's opinion. Hopefully I achieve that. But I think it's why people love Major Tamika Smith so much when they read it. Fantastic. Well, I know we're getting really short on time, but there are some questions that I just I need us to get to. So sure, I hope go ahead. Can, oh, hope everybody can hang on for just a little bit. OK, I've had several people asking, OK, has anybody approached you to make a movie or anything yet? <laughs> yeah, um, I've had a couple of nibbles on that front, which I haven't pursued yet, mostly because I've been busy uh celebrating the holidays celebrating my 60th birthday celebrating 20 anniversaries 20 years of xbox and a few other things but i'll probably pursue that a little bit look i think you know making money as an author is really hard um you know maybe i'll write a, a sequel to the book um but this story could make i think good film um it could make a, a good you know 10 part series it could make a good movie um, I think every author thinks that and very few manage to pull it off. So we'll see if I can figure that out. And if any alums on the on the call have ideas, feel free to, to go to the RobbieBach.com website, send me a note, and I'll get that note and I'll follow up with you. But I'm, I'm going to be pursuing a few of those things uh, probably in February. Excellent. Well, so um, Allie and a few others want to know if it does become a movie or made for TV, whatever. Who do you want to play the characters? Um, so the, the number one question I get when I talk about this subject is who do, who do I want to play uh, Major Tanika Smith? You know, and people go to their favorite uh, black female and uh, actress. And I go someplace completely differently. I, I would say in the characters in the Wilkes Insurrection, I want all of them, maybe with a maybe with one exception, I want all of them to be unknown actors and actresses. I want them to be people who are young in their career and this is their opportunity to shine. Um, I want this to be a movie or a, a TV show or a series where people are found and discovered. And most importantly, this is gonna sound strange, uh, Major Tamika Smith, whoever it is, has to be able to run and run really well because Tamika is a, an Olympic class athlete. And I, you know, I've seen so many movies um, where you see people playing roles and they're just clearly not athletes. And that drives me completely nuts. So, um, you know, the, 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 the people who are in the military have to clearly be people capable of being in the military. Um, Tamika needs to be uh, capable of running and doing that. And um, I would love all of the actors and actresses to be people who could be found and have this be a way for them to get their break in their career. I love that. That sounds fantastic. Um, okay, so one of the, the last things I want to do here is um, the very one of the very last lines in your acknowledgement reads, mm. hopefully Team Tamika Smith has encouraged all of us to become more proactive 
of our are protective of our democracy and more committed to community engagement. When you started writing, did you want it to be a call to action? Um, I, when I mentioned to you earlier, I had three objectives. The third objective of people maybe learning something was that specific call to action. And, you know, the book uh, was way more explicit about that at the beginning and that killed the thriller nature of it. And so I had to find different ways to make that come across. Um, but, you know, my my time since Microsoft, I, I always say I had engineer envy when I was at Microsoft. And so I decided I wanted to be an engineer when I left. So I've become a civic engineer. And my 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 goal in my professional life now is to encourage people to engage in good old fashioned civics. That's politics, that's government, it's uh, policy, it's working with nonprofits, it's engaging in your community, whatever we need to do. And Lord knows right now, it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or Democrat or where you're on the political sphere, you should be worried about our democracy. And you should be thinking about how we reinforce the foundations of, of that democracy. Um, and this book, um, you know, hopefully brings a little bit of that out in a way that you realize at the end, and that is uh, just a pleasant aha moment at the end of the story. Um, and gosh knows that if there's a sequel, um, that thread of defending democracy will uh, will will stay stay there as a red thread through the next uh, the next story. Excellent. Thank you so much. So um, it sounds like you know you you will be starting a next book at some point. Uh, but I think that's a really great note for us to end tonight on. Uh, and it's been a fascinating discussion. I just can't thank you enough uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to help um, connect with the Microsoft alumni uh, and leaning in to this community. Um, so on behalf of Ali Spain and our whole Microsoft Alumni Network team, uh, thank you for joining us. Hey, Becky, can I make one last request to people before everybody completely signs off? Absolutely. Um, if you're a, uh, if you read the book and enjoy it, or if you want to support the cause, um, talk about it at your dinner table. Talk about it at your book club. Um, if you read it, go up and write a review on Amazon and on Goodreads. Uh, you know, look, this is a, this is jumpstarting a very small engine and I need everybody's help in doing that. And if you have a book club, um, I will pledge, if your book club reads the book, I will come on uh, Teams or Zoom and talk to your book club for an hour about the book and answer any questions people have. So I make that offer to everybody and just hope uh, people will take me up on it and uh, help get this uh, jumpstart, this, uh, this engine running at high speed. That's a, a fantastic offer. You know you're going to have people taking you up on that. I, I hope so, and I, I look forward to it. And thank you so much to the Microsoft Alumni Network for uh, sponsoring tonight. Absolutely, and thank you to everybody who's tuned in tonight. Um, if you want more information about the Microsoft Alumni Network, you can go to alum, uh, microsoftalumni.com. And if you uh, want to continue the conversation with your fellow alumni, you can join us on our private online platform, Alum Connect. And for more information about Robbie's book and how to get your own copy, you can click the QR code uh, right there and it'll take you right to the Wilkes Insurrection. And you can see those playlists and uh, order your copy today. Thanks everybody for joining us. Take care.